Today's video is about Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway. I am going to talk about Three Point, the author's life and works. Historical background. The genesis of Mrs. Dalloway. Virginia Woolf was born in 1882. Her father, Sir Leslie Stephen, was a prominent Victorian intellectual who wrote books on history, biography and philosophy, but whose most lasting accomplishment was the huge 63-volume Dictionary of National Biography which he edited and to which he was the most prolific contributor for very many years. The large Stephen family lived in a house near Hyde Park in London. They were a comfortable, upper-middle-class family with social connections both with artists and writers, including the novelists Thackeray and Henry James, and with the social elite of judges, politicians and aristocracy. As was normal at that time Virginia, as a girl, received no formal education. While her brothers were sent off to expensive schools and later to Cambridge University, she and her sister Vanessa had to make do with an informal education at home. Her sister, with whom she was exceptionally close all her life, became a well-known painter, one of a group through whom modern styles of painting were introduced into England. As for Virginia, her father encouraged her to read widely. She used his extensive library and decided when she was still a young girl that she wanted to follow her father and become a writer. Virginia Stevens' life was deeply marked by a number of deaths in her family. Her much-loved mother died when Virginia was only 13 years old. Her death destroyed forever the secure, cheerful family life which Virginia had enjoyed until then. Her half-sister, Stella Duckworth, took over her mother's place in running the household but just two years later, when she had been married for only two months, she too suddenly died. Leslie Stephen died in 1904 after a long and painful illness through which he was nursed by Virginia. Two years later her brother Thobie, of whom she was very fond, suddenly died of typhoid fever which he caught while traveling in Greece. Virginia was still only years old. These deaths left Virginia Stephen badly shaken and deeply distressed. Her diaries show that she was obsessed with the memory of her dead parents for a very long time until, when she was in her mid-forties, she wrote a portrait of them and their marriage in her novel To the Lighthouse. After her mother's death Virginia's mental health deteriorated. She suffered her first serious breakdown in 1895 and her second after her father's death in 1904. At that time, she was seriously incapacitated for many months. She suffered hallucinations and attempted to kill herself by throwing herself from a window. In 1910 and again in 1912 she was forced to spend some time in a private rest home. In 1913, she was again severely ill for many months and again attempted suicide. Her breakdowns became less severe after 1916, but for the rest of her life she was always liable to suffer from grave depression, nervous tension and physical illness. The madness of Septimus Warren Smith in Mrs. Dalloway and his treatment at the hands of the doctors are closely based on Virginia Woolf's own experiences. After their father's death the Stephen sisters set up home in Bloomsbury, a less fashionable district of London than the one in which they had previously lived. It is a district which, containing the University of London and the British Museum, is more associated with intellectual life and less with the luxurious living of the aristocracy. Their home became a meeting place for their brother's friends from the University of Cambridge and there was formed what became known as the Bloomsbury Group. This group of friends represented much of what was most modern both in their rejection of the oppressive taboos of Victorian moral and sexual life and in their cultural and intellectual interests and achievements. The post-impressionist paintings of the French artists Paul Cézanne (1839–1906) and Henri Matisse (1869–1954) were introduced to England by one of the groups, the influential art critic and painter Roger Fry. 1866 to 1934. Others read and translated into English the works of the Viennese founder of psychoanalysis, Sigmund Freud, 1856 to 1939, and trained as psychoanalysts. In literature, 
the novelist T.M. Forster, 1879-1970, and the poet T.S. Eliot, 1888-1965, were associated with the group. Virginia Woolf was to become its most celebrated writer of fiction. A revolution in economic theory was to be accomplished by another member, John Maynard Gaines, 1883-1946. The Bloomsbury Group was influential in English intellectual life for very many years. In 1912 Virginia Stephen married Leonard Woolfe, 1880-1969, a young man who had been among her brother's friends at Cambridge. Unlike most of their circle he had to work for a living and he started a career in the colonial service as an administrator in Ceylon, now Sri Lanka. He gave up this career to marry Virginia Stephen and became an independent intellectual, a professional editor, writer and publisher. Leonard and Virginia Woolf founded the Hogarth Press in 1917 and it became an influential publishing house as well as a successful business. Leonard Woolf was active in the Labour Party and was involved in the campaign for the independence of India. Unlike many of the other members of the Stephen Circle, he was a commonsensical practical man who viewed the dominant culture with extreme skepticism and whose intellectual interests were more political than aesthetic. He recognized his wife's greatness as a writer and provided for her affectionate and admiring encouragement and support. They settled down to a reasonably comfortable life Virginia having a private income. They had a home in London and later also a second home in the country. They employed servants. They ran their successful publishing business together. Their lives were a combination of hard work and the amusements of the wealthy. Virginia led a very active social life and cultivated relations with aristocratic women. Parties, like that given by Clarissa Dalloway, were very much part of her life. On medical advice, the Wolfs had no children. Virginia Woolf is generally regarded as one of the finest English novelists. Her first novel, The Voyage Out, was published in 1915, but it was not until her third novel, Jacob's Room, published in 1922, that she began to write in her characteristically modernist narrative style, rejecting traditional forms of character and plot. Mrs. Dalloway, 1925, is in this line of development as are her famous later novels To the Lighthouse, 1927, The Waves, 1931 and Between the Acts, 1941. She was a prolific writer. She published not only novels but also some very fine polemical feminist books, A Room of One's Own, 1929, and Three Guineas, 1938, books of literary essays, for example, The Common Reader, 1925, and The Second Common Reader, 1932. Many readers regard some of her writing that has only been published since her death as her finest, especially the autobiographical sketches in Moments of Being and her five-volume diary. Virginia Woolf died in 1941. Depressed and frightened by the thought that she was again on the verge of madness, she put rocks into the pockets of her coat and drowned herself in a river which ran near her home. Now I am going to talk about the background of Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway. The period of Virginia Woolf's early life was one of profound social and cultural change. She was born into the Victorian world, and came to maturity as an author in the modern world. In the Victorian world, certain central and unquestioned beliefs and values underpinned much of social and political life, beliefs and values which are summed up in words such as empire, civilization progress and duty. A particular way of understanding history accompanied these concepts and this way is mocked throughout Mrs. Dalloway. For example, in the late Victorian world it could still seem totally natural that huge areas of the earth should be ruled from Britain. The British Empire was assumed to have a civilizing and progressive mission. By the early 1920s, agitation for independence for India the most glorious of imperial possessions, was well underway. In progressive circles, such as the Labour Party in which the Wolfs were active, the British Empire was now seen not as a natural phenomenon destined to last forever, but as a transient historical phenomenon which was already showing signs of nearing the end of its life. 
part of the justification for imperial rule was the assumption of cultural superiority on the part of the British ruling class, and this was based on a belief that European political institutions and processes were rational and civilized. These beliefs were very severely shattered by the experience of the First World War of 1914-18. The Great War, as it was called, was seen by many as a demonstration not of advanced and superior European civilization but of the most primitive and destructive forces of aggression and irrational hatred, as well as of gross political and military incompetence and official callousness and cruelty. Millions of soldiers died in the trenches for no rational cause. Freud, for example, in a correspondence with the greatest scientist of the modern age, Albert Einstein, 1879-1955, on the causes of war which was later published by the Wolfs at the Hogarth Press argued that the war was the unleashing of pent-up instinctual aggression, that civilization was a thin veneer of deceptive behavior covering over untamed brutalities. For those like Virginia Woolf and her pacifist friends, therefore, the war threw doubt on many of the central beliefs and values of ruling class culture, and especially on military values and patriotism. The war did much to undermine the self-confidence and self-satisfaction of pre-war culture and to initiate a new age of European culture, the age of skepticism. In fact, however, there was a long delay between the war and the assimilation of its lessons. Just as Septimus Warren Smith's madness is a delayed reaction to the horrors of the war, so there was in society generally resistance or incapacity to learn from the experience. This failure is a target for Virginia Woolf's mockery in Mrs. Dalloway. There were on too many who reacted to the war by gruffly exclaiming, as does Dr. Holmes to Septimus, that there was nothing whatever the matter and that the best thing was to think about it as little as possible. There were many other indications that a whole cultural world had irreversibly begun to change in this period. The revolution that swept Alloway a whole order in what in 1917 became the Soviet Union was an extreme form of this change, of the challenge to the old ruling classes of the world. In Britain, many of the institutions of the modern world had come into being and were about to take their place on the historical stage, including the mass trade unions and the Labour Party. Ramsay MacDonald became Britain's first Labour Prime Minister in January 1924, six months after the day of Mrs. Dalloway's fictional party. The other very notable series of changes that form an important part of the background to Mrs. Dalloway, are those affecting the position of women in society, a topic of very great interest to Virginia Woolf. At the level of personal and social manners, the Bloomsbury group prided themselves on having been part of that great cultural change which had swept away so much of the repressive prudery of Victorian society. As Peter Walsh remarks in Mrs. Dalloway, so much more was possible for women in personal behavior. What women could say, wear or do in public was not regulated by so many extreme conventional prohibitions as in earlier years. Peter Walsh notices, for example, the modern habit of wearing cosmetics, and young people being seen kissing in public. At the social level, many women had been drawn into work during the war and were to some extent able to gain entry into the universities and the professions. Miss Kilman is an example though still in far fewer numbers than men. Opportunities were still far from equal for men and women, a state of affairs which is largely unchanged today. At the level of politics, the suffragettes, who campaigned for votes for women, had declared a truce in the battle for the vote in 1914 with the outbreak of the war, in order the better to contribute to the battle for their country. On 10 August 1914 all suffragette prisoners were released, and their leader ordered a suspension of all militant activities. Patriotism first. In January 1918 six million women over the age of 30 at last won the right to vote in Britain. It was not until 1928 that full equality of voting rights between men and women was gained. Virginia Woolf worked for the suffragettes in 1910, addressing envelopes. Virginia Woolf's position in society was, then, a contradictory one. She came from a wealthy and privileged family background, 
she enjoyed the society of aristocratic women, though she also made fun of them. She had an inheritance, servants and two homes. On the other hand, she and her husband worked very hard, and regarded themselves as professional people. She thought of herself as an outsider in this male-dominated ruling stratum of society, since as a woman she had been excluded from education, and the power and privileges that go with it. She refused all honors that her fame brought her. All her life she loathed and feared male arrogance, pride and power. She denounced the tyranny of self-important men, Sir William Bradshaw and Mrs. Dalloway being a famous example. In particular, she hated what she saw as male violence, whether it be the violence of imperial rule, of the state, of war, or the psychological violence of oppression within personal relationships. To this period also saw dramatic developments in art and literature. The English public were exposed to their first taste of modern painting in 1910 when Virginia's friend, the critic, Roger Fry, organized a post-impressionist exhibition in London, Leonard Wolfe was employed as secretary to the exhibition. She was fascinated by modernist painting and in particular by its ability to represent simultaneously in the picture things which were experienced from different perspectives and at different times. Painting was not restricted by the telling of a story, as novels seem to be. She was excited by the idea of finding forms of writing that overcame these limitations, that opened up possibilities for fiction equivalent to those enjoyed in painting. For example the possibility of representing people or events from multiple points of view. She wanted to show how each moment in time does not simply pass by but lives on in the reverberations that it sets up in experience, memory and consciousness. Whereas the leaden circles of clock time rapidly fall away and dissolve into the air, as they repeatedly do in Mrs. Dalloway, the moments of experience are like the waves and ripples that are set in motion when a pebble is thrown into a pool of water, which traverse great distances and affect all sorts of odd distant corners. Virginia Woolf was enormously excited by the works of the French novelist Marcel Proust, 1871-1922 whose novel A la recherche du temps perdu she read in 1922 as she was about to begin Mrs. Dalloway, or the hours as she then significantly called it. She shared with Bruce a fascination with time and memory as subjects for exploration in writing, as well as his sense of social satire. Both his novel, conceived, of course, on a far greater scale than hers, and Mrs. Dalloway climax at a party at which people from the past reappear and are made fun of. That year she also read Ulysses, 1922, by the Irish novelist James Joyce, 1882-1941, and had mixed feelings about it, though the idea of the novel as recording a single day in the lives of the characters and of the city may have been suggested by it. Other authors writing at the time who influenced her, especially in their development of the stream of consciousness narrative technique, were the English novelist Dorothy Richardson, 1873-1957, whose novel Pilgrimage Virginia Woolf admired, though with some reservations, and the New Zealand writer of short stories, Catherine Mansfield, 1888-1923, whom Virginia Woolf regarded as her main rival. Now I am going to talk about the genesis of Mrs. Dalloway. The characters Richard and Clarissa Dalloway first appear in Virginia Woolf's first novel The Voyage Out, 1915. They are presented unsympathetically in that novel. Richard is a political reactionary who scoffs at the campaign for votes for women, Clarissa is a superficial snob wholly preoccupied with social rank and success. Virginia Woolf often enjoyed mixing in that world of hostesses and parties and was fascinated with its values and its power to attract people. In 1922 she decided to go back to Mrs. Dalloway as a character, to develop her further, in order to explore that world. She set about writing a series of short stories, of which the first was called Mrs. Dalloway in Bond Street, in which Clarissa goes shopping for gloves. She noted in her diary in October 1922 that she had formed the idea of writing a book to be called The Party or at Home, 
which was to consist of six or seven chapters converging on Mrs. Dalloway's party at the end. Leonard Wolfe remarked in his autobiography Downhill all the way that the idea of a party always excited her, and in practice she was very sensitive to the actual mental and physical excitement of the party itself, the rise of temperature of mind and body, the ferment and fountain of noise. The short stories were meant to examine what she called party consciousness, the ways that people at parties have of relating to each other and to themselves. In the course of 1922, the project for a book of stories was abandoned and she set about writing a novel which seems to have been more ambitious in its intention, and more somber in its mood. What she had in mind was a novel to be called The Hours. Some years later she revealed, in an introduction written in 1928 for the American edition of Mrs. Dalloway, that Mrs. Dalloway was originally to kill herself, or perhaps merely to die at the end of the party. At some point late in 1922 she took the crucial step of introducing into the novel the theme of madness and began to work on the character of Septimus Warren Smith. By the middle of 1923 she was well into the writing of the novel that was to become Mrs. Dalloway. By then the conception of the novel had become far more complex and much richer. She had added to the original interest in the hostess and the party a treatment of madness and an examination of society and its operation. She recorded in her diary on the 19th of June 1923, In this book I have almost too many ideas. I want to give life and death, sanity and insanity. I want to criticize the social system, and to show it at work, at its most intense. The problem she now faced was that of integrating these disparate themes into one coherent novel via the character of Septimus Warren Smith. She incorporated into the novel rewritten versions of two of the stories that she had written for the earlier project, Mrs. Dalloway in Bond Street and The Prime Minister, which is about the mystery person in the expensive car. The novel was finished in late 1924 and published in 1925. After she had finished writing Mrs. Dalloway Virginia Woolf returned to her project of a collection of stories around the theme of a party. She had already written several of these in 1922 and now, in the early months of 1925, she completed the sequence. It was finished by May that year but the stories were not published together as a book until long after Virginia Woolf's death. They are now available as Mrs. Dalloway's party a short story sequence. Her diaries, in which so much information about the writing of Mrs. Dalloway and of all her other novels can be found, are now also all published. At last, I have a small note on the text. Mrs. Dalloway was published on the 14th of May 1925 by the Hogarth Press, London. It has since been published in many languages and editions. Page references in these notes refer to the paperback edition published by Triad Panther Books, Granada Publishing Limited, London, in 1976 with numerous subsequent reprints. This is the end of the video. Thank you for watching it. Please do not forget to click the notification bell, like, share, comment and subscribe my channel.